I'm Elisha Tucker. I'm the Director of Education for the Society of the Cincinnati, and this is Dr. William Fowler. He is the former director of the Massachusetts Historical Society, where we're filming right now. And in our background is a portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette, and behind us is a um, Phyllis Wheatley's desk, and some examples of some of the um, artifacts that are on display here at Mass Historical. And um, Dr. Fowler is the, is the distinguished history professor at Northeastern University, and he received his undergraduate degree from Northeastern and his PhD from Notre Dame, and is a specialist in American colonial and revolutionary history, and has published a long list of publications. And his most recent book um, is American Crisis, George Washington, and the Dangerous Two Years After Yorktown, 1781 to 1783. It's about a crucial and formative uh, time in our history that is often overlooked. And one of the themes in the book that he covers is the hardships of the Continental Army, which is our topic today. So uh, I'd like to start off with talking about um, some of the severe, severe hardships that the soldiers could experience. One of them was imprisonment. And what were the usual 18th century rules of war regarding prisoners? Well, in the 18th century, armies really didn't want to keep prisoners because they were expensive to keep. So they tried to exchange them as much as possible. But in the American Revolution, that didn't happen. Because in the American Revolution, of course, the king refused to recognize the American government, the Congress. So they wouldn't deal with the Congress. And so men who were taken prisoner were not exchanged, but held in confinement. The worst, very worst confinement was aboard prison ships many of them in the harbor of New York around Brooklyn. And there on those prison ships in New York, the conditions were absolutely wretched. A disease, poor food, very high mortality rate. Uh, so they were given minimal care. The Americans, too, held prisoners of war. We had captured many British soldiers. And many of those soldiers were sent to uh, what we would call prison camps, confinement areas, uh, one of them being near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, those soldiers were held in sort of loose confinement, shall we say. It seemed that many of them simply escaped. Many of the British prisoners that were held by the Americans in Pennsylvania were in, in fact German-speaking prisoners. So they could rather easily mingle with the uh, population of Pennsylvania. But for those prisoners who were held for long periods of time, it truly was a very wretched, wretched situation. So who paid for it? Is the whoever was holding them, they were responsible for funding their yes, supplies? Yes, there's all kinds of correspondence back and forth, and some of it rather curious, I think, by our standards, uh, where we would insist that the British pay us to keep British prisoners, and then we would insist that the, uh, the British would insist that uh, they, that we pay them to keep American prisoners back and forth in that regard, which meant that the people who suffered in between were the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so minimal care was given to British prisoners of the Americans and American prisoners of the British. Would you explain the expectation of quarter and what was the controversy in the South over the denial of quarter, or the perceived denial of quarter, and what were the circumstances? Well, there really were two levels of uh, combat, of warfare here. One, where you have regular armies in the field. That is, armies under the command of General Washington on the American side, General Howe, perhaps, or Burgoyne on the other side. Uh, and in those regular armies, the niceties of war were adhered to. These officers considered themselves to be gentlemen. And so when they took prisoners, they cared for the prisoners. Not well, but they cared for the prisoners. This was the responsibility of professional military officers, of which Washington considered himself one. In the South, and in certain other parts of America as well, where the warfare was more irregular, that is to say it was not necessarily conducted by regular armies or regular officers, by people that we would refer to today as guerrillas or partisans, there the war took on a particularly bitter turn. It was often neighbor against neighbor. And in the South and in other places, the war provided an opportunity for old grudges to reemerge. Re grudges, perhaps family feuds, grudges over religion. Who knew what the grudges might be? And the war gave an excuse to wreak vengeance on your neighbors. So it could be, and was indeed, in the South where Talton's Quarter is referred to as a, a butchering or mistreating prisoners. And that would happen, did happen, in areas where there was less control, less regular operations, 
fewer regular offices, fewer, as they would refer to themselves, as gentlemen. And so things could rapidly get out of control, where offices might not have had full control over their men, who then just took the opportunity to wreck savage, savage activities against POWs. Were private citizens ever expected to provide quarter to, to prison? Um, to oh, I see. Um, no, uh, no. Prisoners were prisoners were held by uh, by military officers. You, as a a plantation owner, were not required to take in prisoners. Although I must, there's a slight exception to that. And in some cases, prisoners were actually rented out. That is to say, uh, if prisoners, for example, uh, in prison camps in Pennsylvania, some of the German prisoners that I mentioned before local farmers might need labor and so they would actually rent out some of the prisoners and the prisoners would come to work for them. Uh, so perhaps a little opportunity to make some extra cash. So the prisoners would receive payment for, for Well I'm labor? not sure that the prisoners receive oh. payment. Uh, it's more likely that the uh, uh, the Continental Congress or the authority that held the prisoners received payment. No, I don't think that the prisoners were paid uh, but it was an opportunity for the prisoners to in fact go out and work. Not uh, unprecedented, and this is the sort of thing that has been done with prisoners in other wars as well, uh, that they might you need labor. And so the prisoners would be sent out in the uh, previous centuries, of course, previous decades in the South. And in elsewhere, prisoners in, in civilian prisons were rented out in chain gangs and that sort of thing. So it was a use of labor that was available. And they wouldn't escape? It seems oh, like yes. it'd be... <laughs> oh, no, they did escape. That was one of the problems. Uh, because the, uh, shall we say, the guards were not always very attentive. Uh, so there's a great many prisoners who do escape. It's very interesting to look at the records, or shall we say lack of records, on this. And you can tell inferentially as you look at this that there's a huge gap here between the number of men uh, who were taken prisoner and then the number who were exchanged or the number who go home after the war. Clearly there was a lot of, shall we say, leakage. Uh, <laughs> and these prisoners, particularly German prisoners in America, sort of just decided to stay. And they did. Uh, you described the prison ships. We have yes. a collection of letters of a prisoner that was on the New Jersey that right. was in uh, near um, that was in New York. Right. Would you describe more the circumstances that would be on a prison ship and why they why there were prisons on ships? Well, these prison ships were vessels that were no longer suited for service. Uh, so they would take down their masts, run them up into the mud along the bay, along Brooklyn or, or in the East River somewhere. Uh, and then they would put American prisoners on board these vessels and they would confine them down below. And they would seal the hatches in the wintertime and the summertime. And it was terrible, dreadful conditions down there. Uh, the story is told, and I think it has some accuracy, that the call in the morning when the British guards opened the hatches to allow air to come down, that the call would go down to the prisoners, Americans, turn out your dead. And at that moment, uh, the, the men who had died during the terrible evening, their bodies would be sent up and then buried in a very irregular fashion in the mudflats around a place called Wallabout Bay. And so then they were kept on these prison ships because, quite frankly, it was relatively safe. Uh, they were very difficult to escape, and it required a minimum number of men uh, to guard them. If you kept prisoners ashore, it took more space and it took more guards. So if you had these wretched, wretched hulks that were just stank and dirty and leaky, filled with bilge water and rats and vermin, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, it was a place to keep them. But the mortality rate was very, very high aboard these vessels. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was uh, certainly of all of the events and conditions in the American Revolution, the com confining of prisoners in New York, particularly in New York, aboard these hulks was really disgraceful. Uh, there were hulks elsewhere in other American ports, but not nearly to the degree uh, that they were held here in New York. Was that unique to the American Revolution or was that a practice throughout the world at the time? It was a practice, it was a convenience uh, that in any port it was simply easier to keep these, they had hulks available, these were ships that were no longer useful for any other purpose. So they were there, so why not use them as 
as prisons, and that's what they did use them for. It'd be very difficult to escape from. So yes, they would be, there was a prison hulk for a time in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, for example. Uh, New York was the central place. But using ships as prisons was quite common.